Take your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, the first chapter, be reading verses 1 through 4. I encourage you to get your Bibles to uh, make sure that what I read is what's in there. You may try to sneak up on you one Sunday and you never know. You better be checking up on the preacher. 2 Peter chapter 1, I'll begin in verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because, or, uh, because of sinful desire. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, as we come to it now, we, we do so with humble hearts and open minds. Father, we just pray that uh, you teach us through your Holy Spirit, that what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, and Father, what we are not make us. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Well, on this Youth and Children Sunday, I know that everyone here today wants the very, very best for their children and grandchildren. Want them to have a, a good life, a prosperous life, the very best of everything. We want them to have what is commonly known as the good life, right? That's what we want them to have. But what is the good life? You know, how do we define that? You know, a good education, a nice home, a secure job, a happy family, good clothes, nice car, and in many people's minds, the pathway to all of that is money. The way to have the good life is to have those financial resources. Isn't that why so many people play the lottery? Isn't it? If I could just win the money, you know, they show those commercials, you know, oh, it's for education. How many people you think buy a lottery ticket say, I'm going to get that kid a scholarship? <laughs> That's not why they're there. That's not why they're there. They want to be a millionaire. That's why they're there. Now, I realize that every person in the sound of my voice knows where I'm headed with this. You know what the preacher's getting ready to say to you that the good life is. That you can't have the good life unless the Lord is in it. And because you've heard that a thousand times, you might be tempted to put your brain on cruise control for the next 20 minutes or so. Please don't do that. It's not that, and I ask you to not do that, not because I have something new or earth-shattering or uh, profound to say, but it's just the, it, it's the Word of God. It's the Scripture. So let's prayerfully, and in the spirit of anticipation of what God will say, let's look to His Word. With that said, let me ask you, what the question that you already know that I'm going to give you the answer to. How good is the good life if you don't have the Lord? How good is the good life if you don't have the Lord? You know, one of the elders gave a devotional the other night talking about a guy who didn't have the Lord in his life and he was facing one problem after another, after another, after another. How did they do, go through that without the Lord? How good is life without the Lord? I mean, you know, we, we have money, we have possessions, we have temporary relationships in this life, and temporary relationships even include our family. And to include family in a, world, in a list of worldly things may shock some of you or may give you a little jolt. After all, how can I say family is a worldly thing? Isn't God pro-family? You know, isn't the church pro-family? Yeah, yeah, but if you love your family more than you love the Lord, then you have your priorities flip-flopped. 
if family activities and family visits take priority over the worship of the Lord when it comes to Sunday planning, you might want to look at your priorities more closely. So the world's definition of the good life is that the things in this life, the things that we have in the here and the now, that's what matters the most. Isn't that what you hear? Isn't that what you see on the commercials and on television? In other words, the world's definition of the good life is based on the assumption that this life is all there is. This life is all there is. I mean, isn't that the logical conclusion of evolution? If there is no God, if there is no creator, and we just sprang forth, then it's survival of the fittest. The best, the person with the best genes survives. And what happens is this, is you live on this planet for a few years, and if you're lucky, you might have some fun. You pass on your genes before you die, and then guess what you get to do after you die? There's nothing. You rot in the grave. Sounds like the good life to me, doesn't it to you? So get all you can, put it in the can, and then sit on the can. That's what they tell you. Because now is all you have, and that's why the here and now is what matters the most. It's what you experience. It's what you grab right now. That is the world's definition of the good life. It doesn't sound very good to me. Because the things of this world are very precarious. They can be gone in a split second. If you don't believe that, call somebody out in Oklahoma that experienced the tornado. I think the words of Christ found in Mark chapter 8 speak to this. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? All of this, believe it or not, I hope it has a point. You're probably wondering if it does. But all of this leads us to our passage for this morning. Look in verse 3, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter tells us that the Lord Jesus, through his divine power, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Or, as uh, Phillips renders this verse in his paraphrase, he, said, he puts it this way. He has, Christ has, by his own action, given us everything necessary for living the truly good life. God, by his divine power, has given us everything necessary for the living of the truly good life. And what is the truly good life? Well, you know the preacher's answer, don't you? You know the answer to the question, that life is found in Christ and Christ alone. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly in the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter and the 10th verse. And what we hear these days from a lot of preachers on TV and on the radio and probably this, this, coming, this very Sunday morning is that the good life is what you get right now. That Christ came to give you that abundant life. He came to give you riches. He came to do this. All you have to do is have the faith and proclaim it. But look at the context of the verse. The context is clear. Verse 9, the verse immediately preceding, Jesus, in it, he's talking about salvation. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will receive lots of money in this life. He will receive uh, comfort and peace and joy and nothing ever bad will ever happen to him in this life. No, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He's talking about salvation. That's the good life. I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And what's the abundant life? Salvation in Jesus Christ. That is the abundant life. That is the life that he's talking about. A life that comes to us by grace through faith. A life that we're blessed with, as Peter says in verse 1 of, 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 this, of our passage this morning, through the righteousness of God, of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, it's not by our righteousness, it's not by our strength, it's not by our power, it is all of Christ. The old hymn says, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. 
That's all we have. Verse 2, we find the following. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Do you need more grace in your life? Do you need more peace? Do you want to know where that grace and that peace comes from? Then look in the second half of this verse. Second half of the verse, it says it comes to us, it is multiplied to us in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Now this knowledge that Peter's talking about is more than a theoretical knowledge. It's more than an intellectual knowledge. It's a knowledge, Peter's saying it's not enough to know about God. That's what he's saying. It's not enough to just know about God. Oh yeah, I know about God. You know, I know who he is. Yeah, I believe in him. I know about all that. He's not talking about that. He's talking about having an intimate relationship with God through the knowledge that comes to us by way of an intimate relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. Grace comes to us. Peace comes to us. And they are multiplied to us. How? When we enter the abundant life. When we confess our sin. When we throw ourselves on his mercy, grace, and love, and we seek the forgiveness that are found in him and him alone. Now, I've got to be careful here. I need to be careful to, that you all understand. I don't mean to say that or, or sound as if I'm saying that Christ is the pathway to peace. I'm not saying that at all. I do not want to proclaim, come to Christ, find peace, come to Christ, and find grace, come to Christ, and find the good life. Why don't I want to proclaim that? That's not the gospel. That is not the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that God the Father sent God the Son to suffer and bleed and die in your place for your sin. That is the gospel. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's the gospel. Christ came to die for our sin, not to make you feel more peaceful or warm and fuzzy inside. Is there peace when you come to Christ? Yes. Romans 5, 1. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if you don't have Christ as your Savior, you're at war with your Creator. You're in rebellion against God. And when we come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, the war is over and we are at peace with Him. We see things God's way instead of our way. And when we come to Christ and acknowledge that He is God's Son, that He came to suffer and bleed and die for our sin and place our faith in Him, seeking His forgiveness, that's when peace comes. You've got to take care of one before you get the other. That's when the good life begins. And in that moment, we realize that the here and the now, that's not what really matters, is it? When someone has been transformed by the grace of God, they come to realize that what really matters is not the here and now, but the then and there, if you will. They come to the revelation that the here and now must be lived for the there and for the then. That the things of this life are to be given over to God and His glory. Your education, your strength, your, your money, your family, your everything must be given over to the sovereign, loving God and put your trust in Him. And that's when the truly good life begins. That's when you find meaning. That's when you find life's purpose. Meaning is found in, in, in your life when you realize that it isn't simply to be lived for yourself. It is lived for your Creator. It is lived to serve, love, honor, and glorify Him. That's why we have been created. You want a mission in your life? You want a purpose in your life? Read your Bible. You will find no greater mission. You'll discover no greater purpose. You'll find that there is no greater life. I don't think I could do that. 
I don't think I could live for the Lord. I don't think I have what it takes to do these things. Well, I've got some more good news for you, Christian. Christ has already given you everything that you need to live the truly good life. Which is, by the way, just a way of saying the Christian life. Truly good life is the Christian life. Look at verse 3. Look down there at verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Not some things, not part of the things, not just a few things, but all things that pertain to life and to godliness. God gives us everything we need to live this truly good life. And he gives it to us through his divine power. He gives it to us through the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Now that's a wonderful promise. That's exciting. All of God's provision for us is rooted and grounded in our relationship with Christ. God has initiated the relationship. Our salvation comes from him and him alone. Him and him alone. It's not how hard we worked to get it. It's nothing that we have done. Everything is for God's glory. Everything comes from his goodness. And because of his goodness, and that's the significance of the, second, of the end of verse 3, who has called us to his own glory and to his own excellence. That's why he's called us. That's why he's saved us for his own glory and for his own excellence. So God, by his divine power, has given you three things. He's given you all you need for the commencement, the continuance, and the completion of the truly good life. He's given you everything you need for the commencement, the continuance, and the completion of this good life, better known as the Christian life. In Christ, God has given you all that you need to begin it, to sustain it, and to finish it. How could we even begin in the Christian life except for the death of Christ. How could we continue except for the death of Christ? How could we ever finish the Christian life except for the death of Christ on our behalf? It's all of Christ. All that we need to start, to continue, and to finish this good life, the Christian life, has been given to us in Christ Jesus. You don't need to rush around looking for it. You don't need to run up to Lifeway and find a book or a set of CDs or DVDs, you know, or go to some special conference. It was, if you will, a package deal. A package deal. Some of you, like me, are old enough to remember when there was nothing open on Christmas Day. You remember that? Remember that? You could go out and you're just wasting your gas and your time if you're trying to find something open. And the worst possible thing, or one of the worst possible things that could happen to a kid on Christmas Day was to get a gift, a fantastic gift like a car or a train or some mechanism that, that, that would do something wonderful and there were no batteries. Oh my gosh. You, were, I was just, you, you had this phenomenal toy but it wouldn't move an inch because it didn't have the power it needed on the inside. That's the experience of religion for a lot of people. They have ideas about Jesus. They have ideas about religion, but it never moves. It never changes. And they remain unchanged. They take it out of the box. You look at it. They put it on the shelf. They observe it, they show it to people, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't go anywhere. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That's not what Peter's talking about. Maybe that's what you have. I don't know. But Peter's talking about a transformation where we have been given everything we need. Look at verse 4. By which... By which, I guess you need to go back to verse 3 where it says that it is through his glory and his goodness, through his glory and his goodness, he has given us very great and precious promises. Very great and precious promises. He's given you his word. He's given you his Holy Spirit that he promised to send you. And, why, and, and what do they provide? What do the very great and precious promises provide? 
Look at the second half of the verse. Through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. On the basis of these promises, in other words, these promises given to us, we participate in the reality of God. We are set free from the corruption that is in this world. On the basis of the Word of God, on the basis of how He has revealed Himself, through these promises, through the Bible He gives them to us, we get a greater knowledge of God, we gain a greater understanding of who He is, and the more we know about Him, the more we grow in grace, the grace that He has given to us. That's the Christian life. You don't just get saved and get set on the shelf with no batteries. You're saved and you're empowered to work and to grow for Him. Now something we need to notice here is that what Peter's describing is not the goal of the Christian life. It's not the goal to which we are moving. Instead, it's the starting blocks. It's the starting blocks from which we, we spring. He's telling us who we are through our new birth in Jesus Christ. And if this doesn't sound familiar to you, there's a couple of reasons, I think, that it might not. First reason it might not sound familiar to you is that it could be that you've never come to genuine faith in Christ. So all you know is some form of moralism. A sort of recharged, reoriented interest in making a go of things in order to improve yourself, in order to have a better life. That's not biblical Christianity. Or it could be, second reason, it could be that uh, having been saved by God's grace, you haven't really heard this. You've never been taught. You haven't had the benefit of understanding the magnitude of what it is that has happened to you when you became a member of the family of God. Now, I, I say all this by way of encouragement. You guys look at me and say, that doesn't sound very encouraging to me. You know, I don't want you to lose heart. All of these things that we've been talking about, all of these things... Coming to Christ for salvation, the grace and peace that comes to us through the gospel, repenting of your sin, finding meaning, finding purpose, coming to know the truly good life that is found in Christ, all of these things are for our encouragement because we have them all in Christ. And you might, some of you might be hearing these things and you're saying, slow down, preacher. I cannot wrap my mind around all of this. My brain is going to explode. I don't know what to do. I can't ever get all of this down. I can't get it all done in my life. Peter, listen to me, Peter isn't talking about the goal that you're moving toward. He's talking about where you spring from. Your Christian life, brothers and sisters, your Christian life is going to be the discovery and the rediscovery of the magnitude of what all this means. But it is all yours right now. It's all yours right now in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been saved from sin's penalty. We are being saved from sin's power. And we will be saved from sin's presence. God, through his Son, he's taking care of everything. What's being said here is this, be in practice what you already are in the Lord Jesus. And that's hard to get to, isn't it? You know who you are, but we have to grow up to become it. We have to be in practice what we already are. Some of us may think that, uh, I don't know, let's look at it this way. Some of us may think, well, I, we need a good therapist. Me and my wife do because our marriage, my spouse upsets me. I leave the drawers open. Uh, I forget to take out the trash, and it's World War III, and, w you know, something happens, and we royally get on each other's nerves. Others are concerned about some area, other area. They want to be a better friend, a better father, a better mother, a better employee, a better whatever. Whatever it is, you're just failing. You feel like you're failing. The longer... I'm in the ministry, and I don't want to make all this sound too simplistic, but the longer I'm in the ministry, I'm finding that these things are symptomatic. You don't need 10 verses on how to be a better husband. 
You don't need a book or a CD or whatever that tells you how to improve yourself on this or that. That's, as, that's okay as far as it goes. But let me tell you something. What you need to do is understand 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. You need to understand the Scripture. You don't need to read what some man or some woman has written about it. You need to understand that Scripture. Understand that God has already done for you everything that you need. That through His divine power, He's giving you everything that is necessary for the living of this Christian life. He's made it all available to you. God has changed you. And the process, the changing continues. And when you discover all of that, you ask yourself, when you discover that you've been changed, when you discover that it's by grace that you've been changed, and that it's only by grace that you've been saved, when you discover that all that, I find myself asking, I don't know what you ask, but when, I, when you discover how great the grace of God is, I, you ask yourself, why am I holding my spouse to such a high standard when I'm such a dreadful, miserable wretch? If Christ hadn't redeemed me, where in the world would I be right now? Beloved, instead of trying to make yourself better by doing what you think is right or doing what you think is good, why not spend some time pondering the cross of Christ? Get out your Bible. Read what happened on the cross of Christ. Instead of trying to follow all of the rules of religion, why not, I don't know, why not take a bath in a great big tub of grace? Why not just soak in the grace of God and just rest in the wonder of who Jesus is and what he did? Then, you see, what that brings about, that, that, that's what brings about the change. That's what brings about the change that is needed to help you be better, to be a better husband, to be a better wife, a better employee, a, a better whatever. What, that's what it does. You can rub cream on the symptoms all you want to, but until Christ deals with the root of the problem, nothing will ever change. Have you ever dealt with the root of the problem? And the root of the problem is sin. Have you ever confessed your sin to Christ? Have you ever placed your faith and trust in Him genuinely and truly? Have you ever done that? You see, grace, grace crushes our pride and forgives our sin. And it's our pride that creates our sin. It's our pride that says, well, why can't she do any better than that? Why can't he do this? Or, why can't they do this or that? When you see the grace of God that forgives you as a sinful person, you see other people differently. Have you ever dealt with your sin by way of the grace of God? Have you ever placed your faith and trust in Him? Until that happens, your life at best will be superficial. I implore you, I beseech you, I think the King James says. I beseech you, I implore you, be reconciled to God. Find in Him, find in Christ that truly good life. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for your word. We praise you that you have given it to us. Father, may we seek your will, your word, to be transformed. May we soak in your grace. May we ponder who you are, Father, that we might become more and more what we already are in your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Closing hymn or chorus is, Oh, how he loves you and me. Isn't that a blessed thing to know? Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. He gave his life. What more could he do? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. That's the grace. That's the love that can change you. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he loved you and died for your sin. 
be reconciled to God. 